Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Myself, Pranav Nair, on behalf of ESL IIT Guwahati, would like to extend a very warm and heartiest welcome to each and every one of you present here, witnessing the third episode of Startup Odyssey, an initiative to educate the entrepreneur in you. In case you missed out on our previous episodes, kill the FOMO by checking out on our YouTube playlist. It is rightly quoted: "Success is not final." failure is not fatal it is the courage to continue that counts and one such person who had the courage is present amongst us it is my proud privilege to introduce you to the speaker of this evening marcus buxer he is currently the co-founder of dudash situated in cologne germany he was also the founder and ceo of ur expert ug sir marcus attained his mba in entrepreneurship from maastricht university of business and economics and is currently also an advisory board member there now without any further ado i shall invite our speaker marcus buck to enlighten us on his opinion of how to validate your startup idea sir the stage is all yours you have our attention well thank you very much pranav for that very warm welcome and uh, also from my side hello everybody uh, to today's session Uh, I'm glad to be here for a second time uh, after last year's episode already, uh, because especially that topic of idea validation is something that is really <clears throat> important to me myself, um, because I know that failure in starting up a business can be so hard. And uh, even though I'm having this workshop today with you and talking about how to validate idea in order not to fail, um, it is part of an entrepreneurial journey that also I myself felt. Uh, beforehand, but that is the beauty about starting up because um, if you kind of get rid of that sense of you always have to succeed and and only define yourself through success, then you have the actual chance to also learn from those mistakes and then move forward in order to succeed at later time. Because uh, barely there is any entrepreneur out there going out with every idea succeeding. Uh, obviously, the more businesses you start, the more insights you get, and the more. Pinpoints, you know. Okay, I have to watch out to this specific element in order to not fail again. And that is what entrepreneurship is all about: learning from the failures that you have in the past. So today, I would like to talk about uh, how to validate your startup idea. And I'm here by also starting my screen share. So before I got into today's topic, I think Pranav has already uh, stated uh, or had a great summary of what my past looked like. Um, and again, I have started my own entrepreneurial journey actually before I started my first studies uh, in a small internship um, that I was taking part of, and this is how I entered that space because in there, at the end of that internship, I continued in one startup idea, which was 360 degrees live transmissions in uh, to the world from the stadiums of a uh, football stadium. So we were having cameras right in the middle of the st uh, the fence in order to. Broadcast that into that world, and there we already had to do quite some customer validation because you know, especially when you come up with something that the user is not used to, you first have to identify is that something they need, how do they like to have it, and this is where this whole journey of starting to validate things through different methods has actually started for myself, and since then I have kind of continued doing that. So I will share some of those insights that I had. Uh, over my past as well with you, and I'm looking forward at the end of the session to get to know your ideas as well, where you're at. Um, we will also do have a Q and A. So um, whenever you have a question, feel free to already put it into the chat throughout the session. And I think Pranav, if that's fine for you, we would pick them up towards the end and just go through them and be able to answer them. So feel free to shoot them out there, and I'm happy to answer as much as I. Can to the best of my knowledge. So <clears throat> before we actually start uh, today's session, I would uh, like to get to know a bit about your needs. So um, feel free to kind of uh, use your mobile phone, copy that QR code, or if you don't have that functionality, please enter this uh, URL which I'm attaching here in the chat. Um, this is just very two quick questions to kind of get to know which stage you're at right now. What are your biggest needs? So I can also focus a bit better on those elements throughout the session. So I would be just asking you to quickly go through them. Um, again, there's no sign up needed. The very first question um, of those two is, what are your top three problems in starting your business? And if it's possible, just use one word answers because one of the things um, that I've learned and that I try to use throughout my whole entrepreneurial journey 
is to be able to break things down into three words. If you're capable of doing that, um, as you will also see throughout today's uh, uh, presentation, you will see what benefit you will be able to derive out of that. So um, just to check, um, did anybody have the opportunity already to get on that link? Is it working for you? Okay, I get the first answers coming in. So that's great. Just uh, thank you, Palash, for that uh, quick feedback here. So I guess once we have a couple of people answering that question, then uh, I can also enable you to answer the second question. And then obviously I will show to you also your answers. I'm just not putting them up yet in order to not uh, bias your own answers at this point in time. Interesting answers coming in for sure. Um, once we have just a couple of more people, then I will move to the next one so that we have a good overview of today's audience in here. Because in the end, what I'm currently doing is nothing else than validating, right? Um, this initiative right here uh, to start the session of how to validate uh, your startup idea, uh, in the end, it's nothing else than asking the right type of questions, getting to know your audience, knowing how they think about specific elements. And this is now going back exactly into that. In order to be able to target today's workshop to you, which is the same as building a product, I first need to get to know what are your current needs. So I see I already got 10 answers in here. So uh, thank you very much for your participation. I will now open up the second question as well. Um, so I'm just moving to the next one. So the other question is just uh, select the answers. You can use up to three uh, answers here which element of the customer validation are you familiar with as of now? So which are the ones that you've used yourself in the past just to kind of get a sense of how far you are with customer validation on your end? Again, once I have a couple of answers in, I will then uh, show the answers to you guys as well so that you also get a sense how far the other ones are at this point in time. Great, I see answers coming in very quickly for this one. And then uh, I would be just waiting one, like 20 seconds more. And then I don't want to extend this too much. But there is already a very clear picture of what you guys have so far done. Uh, interesting to see. All right, great. I think that should already be sufficient in here. Uh, I got 15 answers overall. That's great. Thanks for that uh, huge participation here. I'm now going back to that other screen again. So. This time I'm now showing you the results uh, of what you have submitted in the first place. So I was asking you for your top three problems in starting your business. I just tried to build a word cloud quickly out of that, showing what, what is it all about. Um, so you can see the top ones are a bit bolder. I see some of it around idea, scalability, mentorship, and funding. Um, I have that seen over and over again, finance, funding, funds. Um, so it's very interesting. Many startups uh, perceive that, especially in the beginning, it's all about growing your business and funding. Um, if you've done customer validation right, right from the beginning, <clears throat> funding is just a natural consequence of that. If you've done your job and you're able to show your KPIs and show the investor the confidence to invest in your business, funding is a natural, really a natural consequence of that. So. Um, today's session, it's great to see that some people have also put in that topic of idea, idea validation and scalability, uh, because that is exactly where everything starts with. And the future success of your startup is starting actually with the idea stage. So looking at which type of customer validation you've guys done so far, um, I see that probably throughout the university studies, the majority of you have done surveys and internet research. Um, I'm glad to see that some people already have uh, done some willingness to pay, which is not very usual. Um, Net Promoter Score, none of you have done so far. We can just shortly touch upon that, uh, eye tracking and others. So again, I'd be happy to see what else uh, of, of uh, customer validation you've done at a later point in time. So thank you again for your participation. That helps a lot to frame a bit of today's session. So let's quickly get in here. It says, this is a common saying here in the in the start workspace, right? That 10% of your business is the idea, whereas 90% of it is the execution. You know, many startups, when they go out to an investor, they're fearing to share even their pitch deck 
I don't know. I have my secret sauce in here. I don't want to share it. Can you sign an NDA first? The moment you get into this sphere, the investor will never look at you. So we're talking about all those people looking for funding. Investors will not take your startup directly, your pitch deck, and move it somewhere. Because the idea behind it is just a small portion. The ones that have now put in, hey, I need some hiring talent. I need good people around me. That is the actual case. Because as there is a saying out there, people and investors invest in the jockey and not in the horse. That means they don't invest in the idea. They invest in the people behind it. Why? Because they're looking at the people itself their complementary skills as a founding team and whether they are capable of building a business that will succeed. And all of that starts with the team to really understand and identify what is the need out there on the market and how can I turn this need into an idea and into an actual business. So this is where especially that customer validation phase comes in, which I would like to uh, now touch upon in today's session. When I now look at the top 20 reasons why startup fail, according to CB Insights, maybe you want to put in the chat in here, uh, just quickly, what do you think uh, is the number one reason for startups to fail? Um, you can, again, use the chat function here, just put it in as a word, and I'll be happy to see if you guys have a sense of what it is why startups fail. Again, you can use that uh, chat function in here. No need, uh, Abhishek says. And uh, while you guys are thinking about it, uh, I think Abhishek directly hit the nail uh, when it comes down to that. Because when we look at the 20 top reasons, 42% of why startups fail is because there is no market need. Those 42% could be prevented if a proper customer validation has been done right in the beginning. But... Customer validation doesn't stop with the idea stage. Customer validation actually should never change. You should always conduct customer validation because the moment you lose touch to your customers, that is the moment your business is doomed to fail. If you listen to Jeff Bezos, the way that he has built Amazon, he says he only has pretty much one philosophy that he's following throughout the entire business, throughout Amazon team, is listen to the customer. Because that is what it's all about. And that's why Amazon was able to become so successful. And if we look actually at all the reasons, and I, you can argue actually to be more of them actually related or to be potentially prevented through the use of customer validation. But if we look at those elements that I've now circled, those are definitely the ones that are going back to customer validation. It's no market need. Pricing and cost issues, which comes back to the willingness to pay, understanding how much is my user willing to pay. User-unfriendly product. If you haven't listened properly to how the user would like to have the product, this is what the outcome is. If you ignore the customers in first place, obviously, this is not a good idea. If you lose the focus because you're just thought, thinking about what can I implement next without thinking about if it's of use for the user, that is another reason. And then the element of pivoting gone bad. The reason why you should pivot is because something is not going right. You've identified that the user is not reacting to it, and you have to make a change. Obviously, pivoting can have several reasons to fail. But behind that is if you know how to pivot because you've listened properly, the chances of your pivot going right are high. So this should just give you an idea of the importance of customer validation overall for your business. <clears throat> so let's get into the session on how to conduct customer validation starting from the very, very initial phase of identifying your problem in first place. So how do you identify a problem? So there's different ways to look at it. Um, one element I learned throughout my studies at Maastricht University was the element of bricolage, which means make use of your resources at hand. So what are those resources? This is, for example, my personal skills. What am I good in? What can I do? What is my background? Where am I knowledgeable about? It can also be my social network, right? Who are the people that I know that might be realizing issues and communicating them to me? It is also some other resources, like my technological resources. Um, what do I have access with? Through the emergence of new technologies like AI or VR, for example, there's totally new business models arising out of that that, again, just like I mentioned in that example earlier, open up a new business type that you first have to validate in order to understand if the user would even adopt it. Who would have thought 
20 years ago that a company like Airbnb becomes successful leaving, like getting the strangest people into your house without knowing them before. But Airbnb has understood how the market trend was working. They have understood to change consumer behavior and they've been able to meet that market need while doing very good customer validation by kind of doing very small tests in the beginning and then scaling it from there. Because one person has also put in scalability. Scalability can only start once you have your perfect product market fit. And this is where this piece only comes in. So when you think about recognizing uh, a need in the first place, you can think about your own expertise, your skills, um, and this can be the starting point for your idea. Um, especially investors love if you are having this problem yourself in your own domain, because that means you're first knowledgeable about it. You have that need yourself, which potentially is a higher intrinsic motivation for you to follow through in order to solve it. And this is always a good sign for an investor. So those are just some elements. You can even think about your daily life. I have 24 hours in my day. I'm doing those activities. Where's an inefficiency in my life that maybe other people have as well? And that can also be a baseline for a starting idea. Next is the concept of defining it. So after you've realized what the issue is about, that you've identified, seen the market that somebody has told you about, then it's about really being able to put this on paper. And this is where this define problem in three words comes into place. I have seen so many founders struggling with understanding how to define and break it down to the nitty gritty elements. They're talking about, yeah, and there is an issue with it. There is an issue with it. If you're not able to communicate it in three words, then it's critical because you need to understand always the source of the issue and for why there is a problem in the market. And this is where you have to kind of start your idea, not on the consequences or the outcomes of it. You have to go to the root of it. And if you understand that, that is very well for you to build your business upon. Then there is a differentiation also between a must have and a nice to have. For investors, the must have is usually the better way to invest because there is a huge need that probably a majority of people have. If it's just nice to have, your chances of adoption are just lower because you first have to convince the user that he should have it even though he does not need to have it. So um, this elements of really being able to put this down on paper and to define that are very critical. This three word approach, by the way, for example, we with Doodash are also having a three word tagline, Doodash making startups investable. Our target group, the startups, what we do, we help them, we make them investable. Why? Because they have issues getting to that investable stage in first place. And then once they're there, then it's just about how the funds that they're looking for. So this is, for example, one example on how you can break it down into three words. And then comes that important stage of validation. And here, that subline is really what I mean very, very seriously. I have seen, unfortunately, too many founders, the moment somebody tries to tackle their business idea or tries to criticize it, they try to counteract. They try to defend their idea. They try to say, hey, it's not the case because that is not what you should look for. If you're doing customer validation, you shouldn't fear the reaction, uh, rejection. You should aim for it. You want the user to tell you what is bad about your product. Or if you're still in the idea stage, you want them to really explain what is the issue. And you should never try to convince them that your current idea or your current solution is the right way to go about it. And the important thing is, if you do customer validation properly, and for all the ones that, of you that have done surveys so far, one of the many issues I've seen in my life was that the surveys that people put up are already biased. They have so-called leading questions. Leading questions means you're asking the questions in a way that you're getting the answers in a way that you want. However, in turn, this is just detrimental to your business. You don't want the, to get the answers that you want. You want to get the real answer the real problem. So that already starts with how you say hello to that person. If you already tell them what it's all about, then you're already biasing them. The perfect survey is built up in a way that at the end of the survey, your customer is not even 100% sure about what the survey was about, because that way you were able to extract really the real answers. And if you do customer validation properly, some people hate it. They start a business, they do customer validation, and they realize, hey, then nobody wants it. Actually, that's a great outcome because at least you're not putting in all the time, effort, all the money to get it going, even though it was doomed to fail. 
So that is something what is really important here. Um, I've seen when I ask about what type of research you've done, it's great that you've done both primary research, research as well as secondary. So when we talk about secondary research, it's about internet research. What are um, articles out there, magazines? What do my competitors do? And the primary research is what do I conduct? In my surveys, I'm going out on the street, I'm doing qualitative interviews, I'm doing eye tracking, I'm doing all those type of surveys that you can think of. So really it's about going out testing, learning from the outcomes, iterating, potentially even pivoting, then go out and test it again. It should be an ongoing circle that should never actually stop as part of your business. So this comes now to the next stage, which is, which is now the solution. So once you've identified, you have been able to define the problem and you've been able to validate it, that is where then the solution parts come in. So now you've understood it properly. Now you have to design a solution that is fulfilling the needs that is solving the problems that your customers are having. So one of the best ways to do that is to create an MVP. MVP is not the most valuable player maybe in sports. It's about the minimum viable product. So it's about breaking that solution down to the most important pieces in order for you to prove that the solution that you've built in order to tackle that need is actually taken up by the user and is liked by the user. So that means you don't have to go into the greatest functionality, the greatest designs at all times. It's about proving the main elements of your business idea. And this is all following this fast failure principle. And I can tell you, this is one of the hardest things for me because I'm so much of a perfectionist. I have issues not following through on something, but I had to learn along that journey that sometimes you just need to get those things out because it's better to get the quick feedback on something that is crappy than working one year on it, having the perfect solution and then realizing there's nobody that wants it that way. Uh, especially Germans actually are very good for that because they try to hide their idea from anybody else. They don't want to tell anybody about it. And what happens is they build on it, they put money in it, and one year later they bring it out on the market and realize, hey, I've never asked a person if they even want it. And that's the outcome of it. So it's following this fast failure principle. And um, it's really about doing the mistakes as quickly as possible, to learn from them as quickly as possible, and to improve as quickly as possible. So this is then a good test with an MVP. Once you have that product, you can go out, you can see, am I able to attract leads? Am I able to acquire customers that say, hey, I already like that, I'm just, going that journey with you and I'm hoping for you to build in more features and maybe the first ones are even able or willing to pay because you're already solving a need for them. Um, when I've started my first businesses, for example, this year expert where we are trying to connect uh, self-employed like musicians, uh, sports people, uh, arts people to the customer, we have just used a block building system called Bubble, which is something like Wix, WordPress just to validate it, there was no need. We weren't technical people, but we've kind of built this from scratch in a way where we wanted to go out with an MVP and test it out. Um, and I will also show some tests I've run with that myself at a later point. Next is the beta test. So that feedback that you've gotten from your MVP, you can start building in, in your future product development. And then at some point you can uh, have that fast failure principle going on with that beta test which is like an expanded version of what you had as an MVP, already some more features in it. And going through that will, again, save you quite some time and money because you're building that customer-centric business. That what Jeff Bezos was talking about when building Amazons. And those are the type of insights that you just can't get without asking. You need to have potentially a group of people. And I can tell you, I've uh, myself run through a workshop of Ben Zofiani, a growth marketeer. And he has taught me a lot about how to build survey funnels. And the very funny thing is about, he has actually realized when running all those tests across hundreds of products, because he had that idea to say, every week I'm building a new idea, I'm putting out a landing page, I'm testing it, I'm putting in some money to see how many people are erecting it, and everything that is crap I'm just putting away, and the ones that are actually looking good, I try to build up um, through the help of others. And what he realized, all the people that actually went through a short survey, were the ones that were actually willing to put in more time into your idea because they already feel this type of engagement with you um, that they've invested some time and then they are willing to follow through. They are engaging more with your content and they actually start using your product. So this is something which is very valuable, which I myself have never thought that those people would even put in more and more work 
Um, but that's something that shows that the moment you hook a person and they are convinced of something, even in, in its base functionality, they want to stay with you. Um, and this, in the end, will then lead you in the first place to a problem solution fit, which ideally turns into a product market fit. So it's about, I have built a problem, or I've identified a problem, I've tried to build a solution, or actually then a product out of it. And once you see that there is a match so that your users are reporting, hey, your product is actually fulfilling the need that I'm having, this is the moment where you also will see that all the tension between you and the problems of onboarding a new user will start to vanish because they're starting to come to you, seeing, hearing from somebody else, there's something great out there that I would like to use. And the moment you have that match, this is the very moment where you should then start your scaling. If you start scaling your business before and you're building it on a crippled product market fit, which is not existing, then again, your business is doomed to fail. However, you should always wait for your product market fit to be there and you will realize when that's the case. And then you can start putting in the marketing money. Then you can start putting in more money to get it going. So I'm now just giving you some quick examples, um, not always with the highest uh, resolution pictures, which I'm sorry for because in the normal pitch deck to investor, I would never do that. Uh, but for today's reason, uh, I just had it in here. So I just want to give you some of the uh, uh, ways I validate my ideas while I was running my first startup businesses throughout my studies to also give you a sense of how you can use your actual studies right now to start validating your first ideas. So what you can see here was actually for your expert. The guys that you see in the left uh, playing the guitar, um, I used to be on a TV show with them. Um, they were musicians. Um, and what I did was, as one of the target groups that we had were also musicians helping them to uh, uh, get rid of the market entry barriers to get uh, uh, become self-employed and then be able to offer their services, even like living room concerts to people. That was before COVID. I'm glad that we stopped this business before COVID because it was, <laughs> would have been hard to follow through on that. However, what we did, we used this to see all the people running around them, standing there for a second, could be potential customers of ours because they have an interest in such services and they're interested to listen in, and they are stopping for them to listen. And what we did with those people is we just stopped there and said, hey, would you have like five to 10 minutes? We're working on an idea and we would just like to get some insights without them telling that I know those people, without them telling what our idea was about, just understanding hey, if you're currently searching for a musician, how do you do that? What are your problems with that? What don't you like about it? And I never talked about what we do and how we do it. I just want to get, get an understanding on what don't they like about the existing competition, um, which is also going back to out-competing competitors, one of the reasons to fail, um, just to get a sense of where can we do better. And then I actually uh, asked them at the end of that, can you provide me your email address? And uh, I'd be happy to send you the results of that study. And if you want, um, uh, we also have built a solution to get rid of your things. And that is kind of how I not just conducted customer validation, understanding the needs, but already started building my user base, my potential user base here. Another thing, unfortunately, I don't have access to that anymore. This is going back. Uh, that was in a time where the camera resolution that we had was very, very bad. And we ran some more validation on the market. We searched the market on better solutions. In the end, we were having a camera um, which was out of this world, which was used actually by the FIFA for the FIFA World Cup 2014 when Germany was winning it, which was showing a 360-degree uh, video of the Maracana in a resolution that you've never seen before in a whole studio. Um, so at a later point, we were doing that validation on the product development side, getting a better camera. But this, for example, here was a test that we ran on a game between um, in the Allianz Arena of Bayern Munich. Uh, I think it was against AC Milan back then. And we just ran a test with a small group of people. We we're putting some people around that and we we're uh, uh, putting the stream up to China. Uh, I think to India it was back then to just two, three areas of the world with limited amount of users. And after they've been able to tune in for the first half using VR goggles or smartphone or a computer whatsoever, we ran some surveys in the in the halftime just to get a sense of how did you like it so far, what can we improve, what didn't you like so far, and getting a sense of how can we improve that. So that was one of the other ways how we conducted business. We were also asking how do you access it right now? Are you watching with the VR glasses? Because we have to correlate the experience based on the device that they use. So those were some of the tests that we ran. And we, in the end, went to, I don't know, 10 games to do that overall uh, 
games of the German national team, Bayern Munich, whomsoever, just to get more and more test runs going and see where the issues that could potentially come up also for the user. This unfortunately is now in German. However, I can explain you quick, pretty quickly what we've done here. So I actually use my bachelor thesis to write in the end uh, customer research for my business, your expert back then, because I want to get to know officially from a university standpoint, okay, if you're having a side job besides your studies, and how far does that affect your job satisfaction, your stress levels, your work-life balance, um, and how is it related to your intrinsic and extrinsic motivation? Because depending on how far you are on the intrinsic side, it has so many positive outcomes rather than you're extrinsically motivated, for example, just through getting money. And I was running that study and I was using all the insights I conducted from there. Actually, the last paragraph was just designed for your expert back then. Um, however, it still had that academic relation. And I was able to find out, for example, that the people that are actually having a side job, which was related to some of their passions or something that they really love to do, they had a stronger effect on the job satisfaction and less stress levels and less burnout potential in the end. And it was very interesting to see because I used that data for presentations to investors later on to say, I want to help not just the existing self-employed, but the demand out there in the market, which I also validate through that survey is that there are so many students out there that would actually like to step in that, but they've never considered becoming self-employed because of the market entry barriers we're right now trying to take away. So I use that to validate my idea, also communicating to outside investors or advisors. One other way I did it then with your expert, this was now my master's study. Uh, as again, you can see, I used all of the studies throughout my whole study life in order to validate my business ideas in some angle. So what we did back then, this was the website that we designed for that block building system, which was your expert. And what we did in this case was an eye tracking study, another way of validating something, because that whole study was about how to build trust in an online space. So how we tried to do that was to identify, okay, we have a website now, and we try to simulate the user journey of somebody coming into the website, getting a service, actually booking a service, we build in some mistakes, some technical mistakes, some mistakes that the service provider will be doing that came in and did a service because they were unfriendly. And what we try to track is how does the user behavior change and how does their trust development change? Because, for example, in nowadays time, this e-commerce marketplace becomes more and more important. In times of Corona, where people are not going to shop, building trust towards the salespeople and then uh, buying a product because of a recommendation. In today's world, oftentimes you have those marketplaces. And before I can trust somebody else on that marketplace, I first have to trust that website in order to ensure that they're taking care of a good management of their service providers. So what we ran here was just to say, on every stage, I broke it down into seven stages. I was looking at, they had like this uh, device on top of the laptop tracking where they were looking at. So I was tracking, what do they look at? I was seeing how do they behave, sitting next to them and what did they do? And third, I asked them questions and how and why they did these things. And the very interesting thing was people were not able to communicate and actually did not realize what the eyes were telling me on the other side. And I was able by that to differentiate and understand that, for example, in the first two to seven seconds of people visiting your website, it is not about your content. They don't care about it. They don't care about what is written there. The first impression on whether they are trusting you or not was all based on the designs, the color composition, the way that you set up your thing. If you would have looked at that, and that was one of the most interesting things I found out still until today's day. You know, sometimes when your internet is slow and your page is loading and you have that white screen, I was able to understand where users were expecting specific things to appear because while that one second was on the white screen, I could see where their eyes was looking at. So their eyes were usually looking in the top left corner um, because they were expecting some kind of logo there. They were looking, oh, sorry. They were looking in the center area usually because they were expecting on that main screen to have a call to action there. And they were checking in the top right corner, oftentimes for menu options. So that told me exactly where to position my own logos and whatsoever in order to adapt to their behavior. And another thing you can see here, so you can see on the right-hand side and left-hand side um, some, some comparisons. And the reason why they look different is because this was on the initial view and this was at a later view. And you can see that, for example, all those 
heat maps where it becomes red, this is where the eyes focus longer on. So I could see that the people, for example, um, they didn't look at their name or their what they were doing or the text. All they looked at majorly was their faces. They wanted to get that social presence. One of the reasons to build trust, they want to understand that. So that told me when I'm asking an expert to come in into our platform, please put up a big picture of your face because people like that smiling face and they build trust towards you. So I derived so many information out of that subconscious eye tracking and the conscious interview aspect in order to improve my website before I even launch it because that was still an MVP stage. So those are just a few examples I would like to give to you on how to use your academic studies even now uh, to use for a potential business idea. I would now like to give you, because as you know, I'm part of Dudash and we're helping startups to become investable. And our community platform, which has now grown to over 3,500 users from over 100 countries in the world without spending a dime in marketing so far. And this is all about helping startups first to get to the point of investability by providing a right network of people, connections, knowledge, resources. And one part of it is that users are able to do customer validation through built-in tools in the platform to run that. So I'm just wanted to show you that in case of you're interested and say, hey, I want to run those customer validations myself. I'm happy for you to join our community. But the reason I'm showing you that is just to show some other ways on how you can validate things. So what you can see here, for example, one of the features that we have, we just started asking people, what percentage of the day are you spending on customer validation? And the moment you answer the question, you can not only see how much you devote yourself a day to that, but you can also see how many, like, what do other people say? And then I can compare, why am I different from other people? Is it a good sign or is it a bad sign? So it helps me actually to validate my own perception about things. So there's four types that we do, for example. We ask questions over and over again. I want to connect with other entrepreneurs from blah, 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 blah. You can leave a blank space. You can ask a question like, the number one uh, marketing tool that you use is in order for you to understand, hey, is there a tool that I've overlooked that could potentially help me? And people will start answering to that. It's a very quick way for you to engage other people and get an answer on it. The other one, which is actually the most powerful, is multiple choice. Just like we did in the beginning to get a very quick insight. Look, it took me one minute to get like 30 answers from you, and that helped me to understand your needs better and be able to target it better on it. So here, for example, somebody asked, would you be willing to train your own AIs even if they took hours before showing their trained results? And by doing that, he started getting ideas of what other experts in this area would recommend him to do and be able to implement this into his own approach. Another way that we did at the beginning of COVID back then, for example, was how much does COVID-19 affect your business? And we had people kind of answering to that. And you could get a sense of, um, okay, when they're saying it's negatively affecting, why is it the case? And the ones that are more positively, why is it? And then you can start understanding what do they do different, the ones on the positive side than the ones on the negative side. And you can use this for your own purpose. And then last but not least, that was the example I showed before uh, using this percentage type. Just again, some other ways to validate your idea to give you even more of a sense on how this can work. One other last aspect I would like to pull up here is results from a poll on Dudash. So somebody was even saying, okay, I want to validate which is the logo that people like more. So he just put this up as which one do you like more, logo A or logo B? He got like, after he got 15 answers overall, uh, next time he wrote an article about his business, you could see that he actually took up the logo that the majority of people have recommended him to use. So just another way, a very quick interaction you can do, customer validation just with small posts. Um, it doesn't take you long. You don't always have to build an entire survey to get your answers. Sometimes it's the quick ones if you want to get direct feedback from your community. And then last but not least, for example, um, I was also asking that before of an event um, back then um, when I was doing an event also around customer validation. And you could see here, um, also back then where the people have some idea also with product market fit validation MVP testing overall. So that brings us uh, before I have like two more questions on the closing like earlier with Mentimeter and I also have two goodies that I brought in uh, in today's session for all of you founders here as uh, IIT Guwahati eSell is also our partner. Um, but before I go into that, I know that some of you have also prepared something on your end uh, that you wanted to show, and there's also the chance for a quick Q&A. So Pranav, in this case, I would just like to ask you here, um, would you first like to go on with a short Q&A, or would you like first the startups to present what they have um, 
up to you on how you want to go about it. That was really, that was really great, sir. Um, I would now invite uh, some participants to share their uh, startup idea and have your opinion on it. Our, uh, yeah, our first idea of the day would be brought in by Palash Jadav. Mm -hmm. Hi. Uh, hey there. Can I be, uh, presenting my screen? Sure. Can you see my screen? Now it's coming up, yes. Awesome. So, hi, my name is Palash and welcome to my pitch deck. So, I love art forms, especially drawing. Some time ago, I wanted to try my hand at Patta Chitra, a traditional Indian art form. And when I went to buy the materials, what I noticed is that the shopkeeper was not aware of this traditional art form. He didn't have the relevant materials. And also, I could not find a tutor who could teach me this art form. Since there are so many such other traditional art forms in India, such as Varli, Madhubani, Gunda, to name a few, that could be thinking. What if there is a platform that could address these issues and make it a smooth sale for all artists in India? That is exactly why we are building ART, which is short for Art Revival Troupe. Our mission in one line is to build an ecosystem of local artisans and traditional art aficionados to deliver traditional art tutorials, curated art boxes and art material at reasonable prices while improving the livelihood of artists. Our value proposition shows services that we will provide to customers who suffered the same problems that I did. Through our app and website, customers will have access to a library of art materials, art videos, curated art boxes, and authentic teachers at a reasonable price. And of course, all of this at their own pace. Now, let's take a look at the visual journey. It all starts with us visiting the rural artists and understanding their craft. We plan to build our library of artists and art forms, documenting their process and understanding the materials being used. This process will also require us to convince them about spreading their knowledge far and wide among a larger audience. Right after this comes the process of documenting, uh, uh, documenting their process, editing them, and making modules. In a sense, the business mod uh, model would be a mix of selling art tutorials, selling sustainable art materials, and supporting these traditional artists and their livelihood. Our main revenue sources are curated art boxes and tutorials and sale of art material. While our main costs are the technical platform, cost of sourcing the art material, and the commissions to the artists, what I am going to do to ensure that our costs are low is to use my own skills, basically bootstrapping. To implement that, there are two things that we are doing. First, the tech aspect, including video editing, creating a site, app development, etc. will be handled by us. And secondly, we would leverage social media and the viral media marketing techniques to market our products and services, thus decreasing the cost tremendously. We've gone ahead and made a prototype of the app, which we would like to show you. We have our homepage, WhatsApp and 24-7 chatbot support. And in this section, you can buy our curated art material and video subscriptions at reasonable prices. What makes our product stand out is that all our art material is carefully described and curated by our team of artists. We also provide a comparison of prices with our competitors such as Amazon, etc. Now, let's expand further upon the detailed social media marketing plan for the first month. Some key activities are one, defining the success metrics. By setting a particular goal and working towards achieving that would really, really help us graph out our tasks. Second, analyzing and understanding our competitors. While we realize that there aren't a lot of competitors, we want to make sure that our product has that one thing, that one thing that no one else has. And thirdly, listening to our audience. We really, really prioritize customer experience, and this is a very essential step for us. Moving on, some of our key apps 
to be used are Instagram, Twitter, Reddit, and Clubhouse. Clubhouse is a new type of social network based on voice where people from all around the world come together to talk, listen and learn from each other in real time. From the second month onwards there are four key steps that we shall perform. That is tracking our success metrics, sales per visitor, visitor to customer ratio, etc., auditing our content, readjusting the strategy to make the right impact and launching a plan with the necessary changes. As you can see here, we have drafted a timeline with the key milestones like the incorporation of the company, uploading of regular content, etc. from the span of the next seven months. With this, I summarize everything which I have said in this business model canvas. Buy from us and by learning a new skill, you would also support Indian art and the livelihood of local artisans. Thank you and let's explore India's rich art heritage. Now I would be open to any and all questions. I love it. May I ask one question at first, Palash? How old are you? I'm 13 years old. I'm impressed. I'm really impressed. I have to admit that. I uh, I've probably never seen a 13-year-old pitching like that with such a focus on really important elements. Really, I'm I'm really impressed of what I've seen here. Um I'm I'm very great job that you've done here overall. Um because you've you've Thank really you. It, it, it both i mean with your business of art i mean also the pitch deck was a bit like that it, it had some and this is not being in a in totally not in a bad manner it had some yeah, yeah. topics around it but however it kind of fit your overall theme of the way you've designed your brand around it which it was really cool and the way you built your narrative starting from your own problem and then going to identify that as a greater problem of other people and then from there going into your solution from the pitch deck structure that was better than i've seen uh, 80% of uh, adults really building their pitch deck that i've seen over the last years and i get many many pitch decks here at doodash so uh, first of all i would really like to to yeah give you a big compliment on that um thank you what i would like to understand now taking that perspective of customer validation right i would like to understand how many uh, artisans have you actually talked with in order to kind of start building your product to identify the needs so first thanks a lot for the question now let me start by telling you that there are over 29 art firms in india mm -hmm. and uh, that's something which is really important and i have already reached out to one of the artisans and he runs a school for other artists right his name is monu kumar and he is located in uh, himachal pradesh and he practices kangra art and he really really likes this idea and you know he's also motivating others to help us out in art over here mm -hmm. in what type of customer validation have you done with them uh, did you ask them questions did you do surveys did you do uh, qualitative interviews um just to get a quick sense on that So I have asked a few people about what they think about this but I've not really conducted surveys of any sort right mm -hmm. away since we're still in the process of building further and figuring out a few other details. Okay, great. Because that is I think in the stage that you're in right now as you're also saying we're starting to build that and we're trying to bootstrap uh, which is a great thing I think at this stage it's not a bad idea to do that but as you're building out your product you have already a very clear path in mind that you want to go you go there you shoot the videos and all that that is great um what i would on your if i were you would now start to do is getting to understand if whatever you propose here is actually fitting a greater mass of that people because i've stood that there is many art types but the question is if the people that do this are they just doing it for a hobby right do they even want to earn money do they want to make this a big thing in their life and that is something yeah. that will then go back to your target group to identify is there enough supply on the first hand because you have that typical um <laughs> chicken and egg problem right you need to focus on one side first i think on your end it could be that you first would like to raise more awareness because it helps you with your social media marketing more on the supply side right but in order to yes. get there you first need to fulfill their needs properly so that you get many people in on the supply side and then this could be a trigger to get in the demand side However, you could even flip that and say I'm focusing on giving having 100 people I'm doing a survey 
I put on the table to those people, there's 100 people out there that would like to buy workshop, that would like to buy some arts. I just now need people to produce that. And that could be a more of a pull effect. So did you think about this approach already, like who to target first and how to do that? So I did. I actually wanted to ta target hobbyists. And uh, as you mentioned, I would have to uh, convincing the artisans to, you know, do this is the biggest step in the process because uh, that is the thing which uh, determines how many people would buy it and uh, if they would not. So, yeah, I agree. And mm -hmm. I've thought of that. Okay. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I would not necessarily say, by the way, that there is a just by knowing how many people would produce it, you know how many would buy it. I mean, this is two separate processes, and that's important also to understand. Yeah. You have to be in two target groups with two different needs that you need to properly validate. So you first need to understand on the supply side, are they wanting to sell this, really make money with that? Are they willing to put up workshop videos? Do they have the capability of doing that? Or do you need to assist them, right? That could also be they don't have a good camera. They don't know how to shoot proper videos because you might need quality in order to sell it. And then on the user side, you need to understand how much are those people willing to pay, actually? How much are they searching for something like that? And how do they find it so far? Are they just going to the next yeah. shop? to find it or are they already searching on the internet if yes what do they search what are the keywords that they put in on google to find such things because that will then help you especially if you run great content marketing that you optimize your seo your search engine optimization with the keywords to appear in the type of searches that they so far did and those are the type of questions you can next time go out and ask, hey, are you uh, buying such things? If yes, what are you searching? What are the top three keywords you would search on Google? And those are the questions you can ask very easily in groups. You can go into Facebook groups where people are already yeah. doing that. And then you can take a next step from there. Just some insights I would like to give you. But uh, again, uh, really, I am I have my highest respect of, of your age in that age with 13, with that proper English in that structure. Brilliant. Really, I, I, I really have to admit that. Thank you so much for your feedback. You're welcome. Thank you for that pitching. We shall now move on to our next idea, which will be brought up by Manha Astrar. I can't hear you, Maya. It looks like your audio is not, yeah. <laughs> Still not? <laughs> Maybe check your audio input here. Uh, <laughs> sure. Still not. Maybe Pranav, I don't know if you have more in line. Maybe Manal wants to figure out her audio first and we take somebody else up first. Up to you again. Uh, yeah, sure. We'll uh, move on to the next one and uh, call Manha again. I'm looking forward still to still taking your Manha. I just want to make sure that. Uh, the other stars also can have their chance. Yeah, indeed. So our next idea shall be brought up by Saksham Tandon and Karan Kapoor collectively. Yeah. Right. Hello, everyone. Hello, sir. How are you? I'm doing well. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to. Right. I'll just share my screen. Just give me a second. Absolutely. Hi, everyone. Hey there. I can hear you both. That's good. <laughs> right. Right. So everyone is able to see my screen, right? Yes. Right. Just give me a second. Right. 
So right, hello everyone. I'm Sakshi Mir, and I also have my fellow co-founder. His name is Karan. So basically, our startup is the One Paw Stop, and basically, we are a one-stop shop for all your pets' needs. And we actually have created an online community of all animal and pet lovers together, so that you know we have a strong bond amongst the stakeholders and the time to take in during the various process of rehabilitation, adoption, etc. Also reduced. So the team behind the one pause stop is me. Uh, then there's Karan and Anthony, who unfortunately isn't here today. Right. So the problems that we at once one pause stop solve is a lack of reliability and authenticity. For example, if you see other pet care apps, there are no options where you can actually review the service that you have just paid for. The way that we tackle this problem is giving a live chat bot where we ask for reviews once the service is over and not before that. And we do not rely on any Google uh, Google reviews or any other third party reviews for the reason that we would like to maintain authenticity and re reliability after the service is over. The lack of source as a pet meeting. If you're a pet owner, you understand the problem that your pets fake. In terms of pet mating, and therefore we create sort of a Tinder where one pet can meet the other in terms of the breed, in terms of the age, etc., and they can have a healthy relationship. Then there's a lack on demand of fulfillment in terms of medication, vaccination, accommodations, etc. Uh, less number of twenty four seven available specialists. We have doctors available for humans, but veterinary specialists aren't there in any other particular app. And during this pandemic, this need has even increased further. Right. So the three main sectors which we handle is the medical needs, reliability, and accountability, and acting as a one-stop shop. In medical needs, we not only provide you with 24-hour specialists available to you by just one single click of a button, we also provide you with 24/7 available medication shops where you can actually upload the prescription and get the medications at a house within 30 uh, ranging from 30 minutes to an hour, depending upon your personal location. And also, we'll be giving you discounts which are referred to as loyalty benefits that will also help you financially because having a pet isn't uh, is a strain on your financial strength. Then second is reliability and accountability. As mentioned earlier, our 24-hour review-based system actually helps you understand that which particular service or which particular service provider is actually reliable and accountable after providing the service. Then acting as a one-stop shop, of, uh, except for medication and vaccination, in the one-stop shop facility, what we do is we provide you with various service providers in the field of accommodation, in the field of grooming, then there is pet care supplies, etc which is which can be given to you at your doorstep by just a single click of a button so all your pet care needs are have, have been clubbed together in one single app this is what a minimum viable product which is our website actually looks like we're actually planning on forming a community to connect all the stakeholders in the society this particular uh, community will actually help us in fighting the ill effects of having stray animals in our community for example if you say we, you, you want to report an ill stray animal. The stakeholders in this case, which are animal associations and animal fundraisers and animal shelters will be connected to one another and they can communicate therefore reducing the time taken during the process of rehab, rehabilitation, vaccination, accommodation, feeding, etc. We are actually a starter that's not only planning on making money in the pet care industry, but also planning on uh, making a valuable change in the society in terms of stray animals who actually deserve our compassion and love, but they do not get so. In terms of competitive advantage, there are various pet care apps available, but what sets apart is we take into consideration reliability and authenticity as well as efficiency when providing our services. Efficiency in terms of reducing the time taken and reliability and authenticity in terms of providing uh, uh, reviews from credible sources. The three things that we believe that this particular idea can grow is market value pet industry. For example, just in the United States, around $50 billion are spent each year on our pets. And this is during the pandemic. That means the number is actually much more bigger than uh, $50 billion. Then second is number of pet owners in Asia. On average, if each Asian country has hosts 13 million dogs and 5 million cats. That's a huge number. And just in Asia, that means the number in the United States and Europe is actually even bigger than this. 
this is how a business model of the business canvas looks like. We provide our doctors and retailers with a customer base with the information, etc. Therefore, helping them in increasing the business side by side, as well as taking a small commission from the service providers. It's a free for you, a free for users app where the users do not pay for any services. But we work on the similar lines that Zomato does with the service providers, where they charge a fees with the restaurants and uh, restaurants, but do not charge a fees from their co consumers uh, directly. This is a business. Uh, this is a, a value proposition chart in which the main product is providing them with everything uh, that to twenty four seven, and the gain creator is providing them with a medical log where the pets, uh, where the pets history has been uh, typed in by the owner itself, and we keep a track of the medication, vaccination, and future health plans. And this is our business model, right? And if you want to team up, please drop a text at our email, and we'll be happy to collaborate together. Thank you. So me and Sakshu, basically, we were part of the Clever Hardways Genius Year February cohort, and during that, during that cohort only, we came up with this idea to bring this change in the in the world and to form a community of of pet owners. We then participated in the national level online innovation summit, which is in organized by the. E cell of IIT of I am Rohita, and we were awarded second position out of the 57 plus teams and out of 100 plus students. And we are now planning to take this business forward, and we are planning, we are working on our app and website to make it uh, to make it usable for the consumers. Great. Well, first of all, also thanks to you guys for your uh, presentation. Uh, also, well done here from that perspective of. <clears throat> Your approach of building it in a very minimal way with a very basic website, just going into that direction—that's definitely something I appreciated from the approach that you've taken here. Um, what I was interested about, um, because that was something when it came down to again today, I'm trying to take, especially the 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 perspective uh, the per, 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 uh, ah. Perspective of customer validation, right? So I'm focusing on this today, even though I would have some cones here and there, which is really about. So you talked about first of all, I want to understand how did you identify the problem? Are you both pet owners yourself, or、uh, how did you come up with it? So I'm a pet owner. I am myself have six dogs at my home, and、oh, I went through、okay. the process of adoption. So I do know the problems related to you know、uh, the time taken between the process of adoption, getting them vaccinated, etc. And、right. the, and just to validate our idea before even moving on with the competition was, I asked my mother the idea because she's the one who takes care of the pets more than me, right? And she is handling six dogs at the same time. So I asked her if I build this particular app, would it be helpful to you? And she said yes. And I showed her our website and asked her if we would giving we would give you this link. Would you be interested in you know using it and booking a service? And once she did that, she thought it's much more easier to you just you know have all your services in just one single website or one single app than going to multiple apps and booking at different times. So that is how we came up with the idea. Okay, it's it's a great starting point. Very important is though, if you want to get full feedback, try to get out of your own personal network.、Right. It's never bad to have this as a starting point to come up with an idea, but to validate it, your mom will probably never tell you it's it's all crap, right? right. So that is something you always need、yeah. to remember. So if you want to get outside feedback, another thing definitely that's why I want to ask how you came up with it in first place. You definitely need to go outside of your circle because all of those people will always be in some way biased to you because they know they're answering directly to you and they might not want to hurt your feelings or whatsoever. Again, this does not have anything to do. I definitely see the relevance of that business because I know.、Uh, just the other day, I saw a pitch here on pet pet some some pet app as well,、um, and I could hear from the feedback of those people, and they were also talking about the market size that the market is there. There is no question about the market. So I I definitely see that coming in here. One thing I want to、uh, just mention to you, which is more on the pitch side,、um, when you. Because yesterday I was actually having a, a, a workshop with Deutsche Welle, which is a media company, talking about、um, uh, pitching and how to pitch. Right?、Um, when you go about your problem identification, and this in some way goes back also the customer validation process, just build your narrative around the problem first.、Right. Don't touch on after in the single point directly into the solution, because you would be losing the attention of that person on focusing first, grabbing. Okay, this is the problem. Now I fully understood the problem. 
And in the next step, just like in the customer validation, now I'm looking at the solution. Because we jumped into two or three pieces, I didn't have the chance to read the lower three, and I was already on the solution side. So I was kind of not fully understanding the problem first in order to understand how you want to solve it in the next place, which does not mean that your solution is not suitable for that, but just from a narrative perspective. Um, I was actually putting down as a question for myself, what is your market size in the beginning? Then you came to that market size as a later point. Still, I would like to understand, you first said the money that people spent in the US, then you talked about the number of pets in Asia, and then Great. you talked about the uh, or uh, actual just uh, dogs and cats whatsoever, and then you talked about the pets worldwide. So the question I was having, what is your market now? Is it... Asia? Is it the US? Is it the right. global market? Is it just India? Or what is your market? Because that okay. is going to be very, very important to identify in order to go in a stepwise, like starting with an MVP, maybe just in India or maybe just in your city, potentially. Going very small, test it, be sure to understand what the need is, and then start expanding. So what is your market, I would like to understand? The reason why they actually included US in the first statement and like Asia in the second statement was just, you know, during the competition, right? We use the same pitch deck. So we just wanted to, you know, cover all grounds where we include an North American side and we include an Asian side. So, you know, they do understand the market is there worldwide. That's one. Secondly, the market that we are looking forward is to the mentality of this people actually matters a lot here. In the United States, the mentality that your pet is a family member has been there for a very long time, whereas that's not the case in Asia. And then starting to come here, but wasn't there earlier. That is why when we actually started the app, we wanted to launch it first in the US, but actually that's not a very feasible point, you would say. So now the mentality is coming here. We live in areas that, you know, do, uh, how should I say, host people that are financially, how should I say, strong enough to, you know, pay for such apps and stuff like that and have a mentality that the pet, pets are the member of their own family. Right? So we launched them in our respective cities, that is Noida and Gurgaon. Right, we launched the app there with our minimum value, uh, minimum uh, with our MVP, and once we take their feedback, we start building upon with the help of the I, uh, IM e cell. And once we do that, the product is final. Then we launch it. Uh, how should I say, like in North India itself, and then we move on to India as a whole country. No, that sounds perfect. I think that sounds very reasonable from the way you want to structure it, because again, there is no market that you probably understand better than your own market, right? Um, especially if you haven't lived in another country, it's hard to understand the nitty gritty things. I just give you an example, McDonald's uh, back then tried to move into Bolivia. I was spending half a year in South America and that's where I got to know it like first end. And they actually failed in that market because they didn't understand the market properly. They didn't understand that the people with the amount of money they have available that a $1 burger produced in the US is something that the others don't want. And that is one thing, for example, that they actually stepped out completely out of that market again uh, because they realized that they didn't understand it good enough to be uh, there. Um, and what I, you just said, there's just one thing I want to touch upon. When you then talk about your market size, and one great thing that you can do is the so-called market opportunity with TUM, SUM, and SOM. Total addressable market, serviceable addressable market, and serviceable obtainable market. And this would mean you could say worldwide, there is that many pets and that many people that actually have it in the household and that much money being spent. Then you look at your sum, which could be, let's say I'm now just focusing on Asia. And then in the last piece in the sum, you're then targeting on India and the, let's say the market share that you feel you could capture. And in this way, you can display in one slide, this is the global potential. However, this small piece I'm focusing on right now without confusing the listen on what is your actual market. Right. Um, just as a suggestion on on also how to break it down into those small pieces and display it to the listener. Um, but overall, again, uh, also your presentation was was well thought through from a structure. Again, some minor things that you can just tweak. It's all there. You just have to frame it slightly different, and you're there. Right. Right. Okay. Thank you so right. much for your feedback. Thank right. you so much, sir. Thank you, guys. I hope I'd be able to provide some insights for you that you can take home. I hope. <laughs> if not, okay. feel free. That accounts to everyone. Feel free uh, to reach out to me, Pranav. Uh, feel free to share my LinkedIn profile or my email, and then uh, or just uh, people can join our Jewish community and from there contact me. Um, so that everyone having a question can just reach out. Okay. Right. Thank you for that. 
our uh, next idea will be again uh, from manha asra like to call her mm -hmm. hi can you hear me now yeah well, i'm so sorry for all the inconvenience caused uh, my computer input was a different thing so it caused a little bit of a problem okay so let no me just share my screen give me a second sure Uh, can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay, I do not have a lot of information on the market side of things, but <laughs> I'll do my best here. No worries. Okay, so good evening. Hi, my name is Manha Srar. I'm 15 years old, and I'm all the way from Hyderabad, which is a city in India. And I have a business idea which is somewhat out of the ordinary, and if I can say, pretty ingenious. So let before I get into everything let me give you a bit of a background when i was a little girl i used to help my dad around his ngo which revolved around recycling so i guess my love for the environment has been there ever since and which has resulted in the formation of my company so now my company is called the brick company also known as tbc a one stop solution to waste so we are a social entrepreneurship whose main aim is reduce the amount of waste material by upcycling and recycling it to make bricks we are doing this because recycling is a major problem in india especially because most people do not segregate their waste and also cuz they do not know anything about waste segregation so moving on to our target audience it is basically everybody but more importantly we are focusing on low income households and environmentalists as our product aims to make their lives better and provide an eco-friendly and cost-effective alternative our product are bricks made out of waste yes waste please do not be confused i'll get into it in detail in a little while and what makes us unique is that our product is made up of recyclable film and all other superfluous material that you can think of and also it in turn imparts huge benefits to the environment so what's the problem we're trying to solve over here poor housing leads to diseases chances of rehabilitation and many other drawbacks an increasing waste and improper disposal of it leads to a detrimental environment this bar graph over here taken from the national survey of india in the year 2018 to 19 depicts the number of deaths and the increase in landfills in over just a single year which brings me to my solution which is a never been done before out of the box innovation which is a simple yet complex process to make bricks Our business model is pretty simple to what most companies have. It enlists our key partners, our activities, our resources, our value proposition, how we build relationships with our customers, what will draw customers towards our product, the channels through which we will be selling our products, the cost structure on which we will be spending money on, and our income of revenue. Moving on to how it all works. So the first step is pretty self explanatory we collect waste and deliver it to manufacturing units step 2 we do a rigorous processing of sanitation using steamers and all potential viruses and chemicals are weakened and this is also done to retain that stenchy odor which comes from waste material then the waste is put into molds and hardening agents such as fluor silicate hardeners which is used in concrete and cement are added it is then removed and pressurized and sent to compressors to keep the contents intact and to make the brick compact step 3 is that a layer of hard film made up of recycled material is added this acts as a sealing agent and brings the materials closer together to increase durability and then voila in your hand you have a brick made up of glass shards computer chips pd bottles etc all in coated with a recyclable film the slide you see here has many many parts to it So let's focus on the circle first. The circle depicts our jobs as a company and our gains in dark blue and our pains in light blue. Our functional job as a company is that our brick must be affordable and durable. Our emotional job is that our product actually benefits the environment and our social job is that we spread awareness about waste management to the general public. 
Moving on to the gains, our product is easily accessible, eco-friendly, it utilizes waste material and reduces the use of raw materials, it's affordable and water resistant. But our pains is that our product is not durable enough, its availability is not largely based, the collection of our waste material is not targeted and the exposure to chemicals is obviously feared. So now moving on to the square, you have our pain relievers in dark green. So as our availability is not largely based, our product will not only be in wholesale markets for construction companies to utilize, but in all commercial hardware stores so that everyone can buy our product, whether you have to make a sustainable home, a shed or a dog house. And to make sure our collection of waste is targeted, we will be using drones and to screen areas more efficiently. And as it's not durable enough, as I said, we will be using fluosilicate hardeners, which is used in concrete to make the material more compact. The grain creators for our product in light green show that the level of pollution released by our factories will be extremely low as our raw material is readily available. This also makes for a cleaner and greener, and cleaner and greener environment. An important thing to note is that our product is made for all sectors of society. So let me explain a bit on that. Normally, a brick in India actually costs about 11 rupees INR and onwards. But our brick, as the materials are readily available, will be about 2 rupees. So for the price of one clay fried brick, you actually get five of our bricks. So now getting into how it improves the manufacturing industry and society, it reduces the load on the primary and service sector in India as the largest employer and gross value added respectively, and also provides a chance for the manufacturing industry to redeem itself. It serves as a better and cost-effective alternative for art installations across cities. And it also serves as an alternative for rain basera projects. This is something I'm extremely passionate about. This is when state governments build night shelters for the underprivileged. It reduces landfill waste by a margin of 40% and also prevents employment in unethical practices such as child and born and labor, which is extremely common all across Britkins across India. In relation to that, it also conserves coal as a natural resource, as per the production of clay fried bricks is likely to decrease with growing popularity. Also, one more thing I'd like to add is that this would be the first time a construction company would have released an app for reports on waste overflow and also inculcate an e-commerce and general awareness station onto its sites. It would also present itself as a part of other companies' corporate social responsibility. So this shows that we are both value and cost driven. So now the goals to scale our company are pretty simple. Government support and funding, tie-ups with large-scale corporations such as Coca-Cola, which shell out a lot of waste in, in the few millions every single day, and authorizing other companies to build our products in their, in their facilities for expansion. So now this is just a glimpse in the company's targets for the future. By July 2021, a month from now, we, as we do not have a facility yet, we will be releasing an in-house produced prototype so that we can get investors. By January of 2022, production of mass units will be underway and our website and app with an e-commerce station and general awareness station will be released to the public. By June of 2022, our products will be available at all commercial hardware stores and we would have opened our own production unit instead of using our investors. By October of 2022, I hope that our sales will be at an all-time high and we will be working with different organizations to give back more towards the environment. And then by August of 2023, after two successful years, I would have developed a technique to create a contactless screening and waste collection of areas using self-delivery trucks and drones and also employing rat pickers into my facilities so I can curb the spread of diseases. I know that everyone must be wondering if all of this is really possible. Trust me, it's not like asking you to believe in unicorns. It's just that no one has ever tried to carefully consider all the details like I have, which makes our model successful, which is what I believe. It's like how Edison said when he was asked about all the times he failed during the light bulb. He said, I didn't fail. I just found 2000 ways of how not to make a light bulb, but I only needed one to make it work. So i just like to conclude by saying that our bricks are here to make a difference. It has an incredible rate of expansion because our bricks will be laying the foundation for the introduction of other products such as maybe pipes using the same process, etc. And this product also completely eliminates the need for waste segregation and stands for making something great out of waste. I hope you liked it. Thank you so much for this opportunity. And uh, yeah, thank you so much.
if you have any questions please feel free to ask if you don't have any that's like even better that means i did my job correctly as a presenter so thank you so also thanks to you manha i'm not sure if i would agree with your last statement usually if there's no questions and if you have an investor meeting and somebody's not asking a question probably it was a bad pitch uh, so i just to let you know the best sign in an investor meeting is if you feel you're getting roasted for an hour straight and you feel so shitty after that that's probably one of your best investor meetings you could have had uh, just for you to to get this right here um i also loved however how you ended it and say hey you don't have to believe into unicorns but i kind of just want to i like ambitious goals uh, they're definitely ambitious so i would agree with that statement there is that is a strong timeline for 2 years um but sometimes uh, this is how you can start things off so um also thanks to you on that one um what i was uh, kind of uh, one generic feedback i would like to give to you um i loved your enthusiasm of pitching overall um what would help me to really focus on some elements it goes back to the three word approach i've talked about in the beginning sometimes on a pitch deck less is more just pinpoint the keywords that you want me to remember and leave the rest of the text out because that helps you to talk because then i have more time to listen to you sometimes i was now in a, a bit in a trap to listen or to read and what happens then sometimes you don't know what to do properly and you don't do both correctly again this is just like a small tip on the overall pitching um also with the pain and the gain creators i saw that also earlier on palas uh, one and the business small canvas they are great things for you to really bring it down to the main elements right what is my problem what is my pain? however for pitch deck i would probably not even put them in there uh, because especially with the pain and the gain things you in the end going back to problem solution problem solution build the problem in the beginning build your solution around it and then you can go on from there uh, just as a generic tip for the future uh, when it comes down to pitching um however i love the purpose behind your idea because i think it's a problem that is out there uh, especially in and uh, just the other day when i was watching the news i actually saw some pictures from india coming in um some areas which is really shocking to see that how much waste is 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 laying around there and i love your mission behind your company uh and i'm i'm always having a I always have a high respect for people that want to tackle those issues because they're not easy to tackle from a standpoint of um how can I go about it to have a social mission and at the same time sustain as a business. Um what I was really interested to hear is your bricks are five times as cheap as the normal bricks? Yes. So um, because uh, in India what we usually construction companies use are clay fried bricks which mm-hmm. is why I mentioned about brickkins. it usually it's like a tall tower which has like a fire going in it using coal and then they send children and women from rural areas in there and they like to make the bricks and like take them out so because my raw material is waste in general right i can find that anywhere i step out i see waste so that would be make it very easier for me to like find everything and like make my brick work so that's why it'd be much cheaper also i mean I don't have a, like a money perspective as such. I mean it's great you earn money through a business yes, but that's the whole point of being a social entrepreneurship. You right. add value to society rather than like getting something out for your own self. So when you when you calculate the 2 cents, have you validated this also with producers to say okay, if I'm able to deliver you that and you because they also have remember one thing they have to earn their money as well. They produce that break for you. they need to get some margin on that which in the end will affect potentially the price of your brick as well so have you validated those numbers because to be honest if you're able to get it down to a fifth of the price of an actual brick then you have a great chance to combine your social mission with a business uh, because yeah. then i see a great potential of uh, adoption from a user side because they think i do something good and i pay less mm-hmm. which is the uh, it is easy to convince a consumer of that <laughs> Um, so yeah. I was thinking, did you validate those two cents, or is that a guess in the dark right now? Um, I did not in the exact sense, like completely have it all on the table. But yes, I have thought about it and like worked a little bit out. So who will be my employees are basically rack pickers. So they're basically paid by the government or not even paid at all, right. honestly. So whatever, and I'll also be providing them shelter. You see. so i'm basically giving them a higher level of respect and a better job and obviously the pay will be better than what most governments state governments and 
GHMC corporations offer. Right. No, I mean, I, 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 again, I, I love your mission and I love the enthusiasm that you have behind that. And it's also good to see, again, you remember in the beginning I talked about how do you identify needs. In that case, you started your story from your parents, right, from your father. And you've always been that business. You understood it a bit. The one before we're talking about uh, that their parents were having some dogs and that's how they got to know it. And, and that's the beauty of it, right? Identifying that need, being able to see it. And then this is, you combined your, let's say, your personal knowledge together with what you see right now on a daily life out there and trying to kind of put those pieces together, which is really a good starting point for such a business. I think in order for you really to take the next steps, it's getting more assurance and more proof probably of the numbers you're yeah. um, Like the two cents, if you can actually start getting into, and that's something I, another type that you can do is getting some so-called letter of intents, for example. Yeah. You go out to a producer and you can actually, or you have all those people that are part of your supply chain, the people that collect the waste, the ones that kind of use it and produce it, and then the selling part. And if you can actually get And that's part of an MVP, right? Two, three partners on each, maybe even one to start with. And they're showing you, I can produce it for you for that. And that is the outcome. If you have that MVP going, then you can go out. And there is even social investors out there that say, I'm only investing into impact startups. And then you have a great chance to say, okay, if I now want to scale this and I see the need, then... Uh, you can actually start putting this on a greater level. Because one thing you always need to remember, right now there is many ways out there, but it's also even waste is not unlimited. So at some point, once you've collected all the ways, then you have to think about a new way on getting this. And those are implications that will come at a later point. But again, uh, um, I wish you all the best luck for your mission because it's a very valuable mission that you're on. And uh, I really hope you'll be able to succeed with that. Thank you so Thanks. much. Thank you, Manha. So, Palash Jadav, Manha Asrar, Saksham Tandon, and Karan Kapoor, who just presented their ideas, are students of Clever Harvey, which is a sponsor of Startup Odyssey. Clever mm -hmm. Harvey's programs are designed for teenagers to explore different career options and build creativity, confidence, and business acumen. We must say these students indeed did a really great job. Absolutely. I, again, like, especially considering partially also the 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 age that we're looking at um really um with 13 15 year olds but also the two guys guys also good job really i i you know my co-founders have screened over 4,000 startups in the past one and a half years i have seen so so many pitch decks and obviously there's still room of improvement also your guys again less is sometimes more um business model canvas and the empathy map are great for getting the guest first and then the outcome you will see on a pitch deck but the way you approach this the way you kind of build your narrative really starting capturing important areas of the pitch uh, i think that was really um a, a great start for you guys so um yeah again compliment on that uh, great to see stuff like that coming out uh, of out of such initiatives yeah indeed great. um moving, moving further um, the next idea shall be presented by myself. Um, mm -hmm. I'm sorry to say I won't be coming up with a pitch uh, deck as such, but I will be sharing my idea uh, verbally to you and uh, having your opinion on it. So my uh, problem or the idea is basically centered around the increase in plastic usage in India. Currently, India is going through an industrial and information revolution era, wherein Industries like e-commerce and food deliveries and takeaway businesses are like rapidly on the rise. Uh, so the plastic waste generated, for example, the plastic containers in a food delivery box or the plastic uh, covering in a parcel from Amazon or Flipkart would you know add up to the plastic waste generated in India. And according to the UNDP reports, currently India produces nearly 15 million tons of plastic every year, and only one fourth of it is perfectly recycled. Uh, while the government is trying its best in improving, but one f there is a high scope to do better. Three fourth of the plastic is not yet uh, being you know perfectly treated. And it should also be noted that the Indian government has banned in several sectors the usage of single-use plastic. So this three-fourth plastic, which is being disposed uh, inappropriately, has a high potential of being reused again. 
So what I was thinking is that we can build an app which collects uh, plastic from uh, the users, in particular the household, domestic households, working professionals, uh, even small scale uh, shop uh, shops and malls and some certain industries which have a lot of plastic uh, waste generation. And going on to the revenue part, we could uh, recycle it, reuse it, uh, and then sell it out to um, do the resale of it. Or alternatively, there are certain industries who also uh, require plastic as their raw product. So we could recycle it and sell it to those industries as well. Um, regarding this, I've also conducted a few surveys as to knowing the demographics of the people who have uh, done the surveys, as well as um, do they feel that they have sufficient plastic for uh, recycling and could earn a bit of extra income and the response what i got was like 50 50 some say yes some say no uh, some of them the people who say no they feel that they do not have enough plastic for uh, selling out and some of them uh, do not wish to give away their old plastic they say that rather i would reuse at my own place rather than giving it out to you but yeah we have also had an equal amount of favorable responses and also people who would wish to uh, join the company. For example, if the company is there, we will require people to go and collect the plastic from households. So the pe such people can be the rack pickers, also up to a certain extent delivery boys and various volunteers uh, who are there along with the environmentalists and want to make the uh, nature a better place. So that was the idea of uh, what it's centered around. And yeah, that's what I'd say. <laughs> Thanks for that oral pitch as well. Um, the reality sometimes is also that you do not always have a pitch deck at hand when you're meeting somebody in your, as you call the elevator pitch, right? So you sometimes only have 20 seconds and you need to be able to communicate that orally as well. So it's not a bad uh, thing to not always have a pitch deck uh, with you. So based on that, the first thing. Um, second thing, I think Manya could be a good buyer from your waist in that case because she anyhow needs to collect it. So, uh, uh, there could be some synergies coming in here. Um, when you talk about the problem side of it, <clears throat> what, one thing I was wondering why when you kind of build that narrative again is the problem, I mean, I said that to Mania as well, um, is obviously there. The waste problem, not just in India, but also in other countries in the world, even Germany still, I mean, it's less of a problem here than in other parts of the world, especially with the industrial uh, countries which are now going into that area. Um, but what you identified as a problem is a problem of the state. We as India do have that issue. Now the question is, the ones, your private customers, are not the state as an issue itself. You're talking as customers, the actual consumer, the people living in their households. So when you think about your idea, one thing I was a bit lacking here in terms of the problem side, what is their problem with having the way? Do they feel so? The type of questions I would be asking such a survey now is: In how far does ways affect your life? What negative effect does it have? How do you try to overcome it yourself? What do you do? You do with your ways as of now. It's less about do you want to earn money? Do you have enough ways? It's more about what is your first issue, right? Because that is already going into a. You're hinting towards a solution. You can make money by selling that. The question is not if they can mon make money by selling it. The question is, do you have an issue with producing that uh, plastic in first place? How do you go about it? And um, what do you do with it? What are the channels that you use? Are you even concerned about waste overall? Is that an issue for you? Because all the ones that are not concerned about waste, they might not even be your customer at all. So I would probably, and that's, that's why I meant probably with that leading question, even though you've got a 50-50, and that's something I would have expected as well, because people like to complain about, oh, there's waste and I don't want this, but taking an initiative against it, and that's why I also cheer people trying to tackle those problems, taking that initiative is always a hard thing. So from that problem side, this is where I would like you to focus on probably a bit more understanding what is the problem of my consumer, the ones I need to collect the waste, because once you have the waste, then obviously your solution then can build upon and then you can sell it, you can recycle it, you can sell it to companies like Manga I want to build, the ones that want to take recycled pieces and build a new product out of it, right? And then the question would also be in how far does your app will add value to the user? Why does the user, the household, need your app? 
to collect that. That piece for me, for example, was not 100% clear on the connection on how you identify the problem and how your solution fits right into that, uh, okay? And those were just some points I would like you uh, to take home uh, from that. But again, like all those initiatives, I highly cheer uh, because I, it needs those type of entrepreneurs in, the, in today's world to get rid of the problems that we're having for sure. Yes, that was quite in uh, insightful. Um, in fact, I guess I skipped out on a very key point that the plastic uh, waste which is generated, there are like various types of it. So the motive behind keeping an app is the users can register themselves on the app and we can keep a fixed rate that based on this type of plastic you give, you get this much per kilo, per kilo mm -hmm. or per gram of it. So that will be a you know incentive or a motive for the users to give away the plastic. Like they can earn some additional income from that as well. Yeah. That app, by the way, could show how much they have done a better job. In today's world, especially if you have a social cause, you should show not only how much money do you make, but what is your social impact? What is the impact that you're giving? Because all the consumers that are now being part of the app that want to use it, they have a higher purpose beyond it. They will not just do it for the money. They probably want to do something good. So try it. If you know what is the outcome of one kilogram of plastic laying in my ocean or laying out there, what is the negative impact of that? And if you convert that by saying you're now saving this from going there, and then you can calculate the impact in terms of CO2, or carbon dioxide, for example, on waste, on less deaths, for example, like Manya was showing the statistics, I think that is something that could then incentivize the user to use the app because he, he's being rewarded every single time he does it. He feels that I'm doing something good. And, and that is, I think, something you can play with, even though I don't want to use the word play in such a context. Uh, yeah. Um, thank you, sir, for that. Um, we shall move on to the next idea, which shall be brought to you by Pranal Prajapati. Just to get a sense, Pranal, how many are following? Just for me to know in terms of feedback length. Um, currently nine. Nine left or overall nine? Um, yeah, we have nine of them left. And I guess most of them would be like verbal pitching. Okay. So maybe we keep some of the feedbacks a bit shorter then so we can yeah yeah hello hi am i audible yes yeah. so i'm going to present my screen so our uh, startup is called repair Hub. so basically when i was in campus i had a problem my phone broke i still <laughs> have that broken phone <laughs> crack on the screen so uh, we went around the campus, we found all the shops, but there was not a single shop which could repair my phone. Uh, my friend broke his specs. Uh, he even tried to look a shop in the campus around the... So, uh, to give a context, our campus is on the other side of the river from the city. So, literally, there are uh, no equipment repair shops in the entire campus. And even there are many places around here where my friends live, where there are no shops uh, which repair. So... What in today's world also there are many fields which are moving towards online. Like we can order food online, we can order clothes online, uh, we can order all household items online. Uh, in that the only place where it is backing to move online is equipment repair. So what I think the problem is. So nearby uh, people are not able to find shops nearby where they can get uh, their stuff fixed. And even there are people like me who are quite lazy to actually go to a shop. It is much more convenient to just like Zomato and food when you are lazy to cook. So that is the main problem which I think here. So what we came up with solution is an app, one app which can uh, include all repair shops which are nearby. you. So you click there like... Uh, phone repair you can get uh, the list of all shops which uh, do phone repair you can call them they come to your door they take your equipment they see uh, what damage is done they can give you an invoice like it might cost this much money it might take this much time take the equipment repair it and then return it back then we also did a survey we passed it out uh, on our linkedin we gave it to our friends we sent it to other colleges so what happened is that 59% actually preferred the offline repair instead of uh, the online repair option. 
So the major reasons we asked the people who preferred online, like what was the reason you would go online offline. So they said that offline was actually more convenient than online. They had shopkeepers who are familiar to them. They can bargain with them. They can reduce prices. They have trust that they won't actually take their phone and run away, uh, which we can't really give in online. Uh, then they had cheaper rates since they have been going there for years and years. They can get some uh, discounts like. Two percent discount. Like I have a shop owner over here, which we have been going for uh, many years. So he gives five percent discount on all the medicines which we buy. So this type of uh, uh, perks are not available in online. So when we passed out, since naturally being nineteen uh, ourselves and all our friends being in our age group, the survey result mostly had eighteen to thirty uh, age group. Which is fine, I guess, since uh, the most people that use online stuff that use Zomato, which use Amazon, uh, Flipkart, are this eighteen to thirty group. Mm -hmm. So, in conclusion, we were, are trying to make an app which can deliver this, but uh, we found out that the majority people uh, actually prefer offline going to the stores, which uh, might be more inconvenient. But uh, there are some perks which they have, which uh, we have to figure out and how to get online. So, uh, and also we also looked around for competitors. There are a few websites, but they have quite specific. Like uh, you can repair OnePlus phone on and OnePlus website. They can come to your home, uh, but uh, there is no one app for all the equipment repair. I cannot get my laptop and phone repaired on the same place. I cannot get a repair for my specs on the same website. So to conclude that, I believe this has potential, but uh, there we. Uh, the customer survey which we did showed that a lot of people actually prefer offline. So thank you. And any questions? Yeah, I think uh, <clears throat> thank you also, Kunal, for your presentation. Um, I love to see the honesty that you put yourself up here and say, "I'm not even sure. I have a survey, and uh, yeah. that, that's all it is, right? That survey yeah. really, uh, helps you now to understand: is it worth going further or not? Yes. Looking at the market. To be honest, you don't need 100% of a market to succeed. There is business yeah. out there just tackling 1%, not even that, and they're still succeeding. So mm -hmm. not necessarily you need to have uh, all people yeah. adapting to it. I think what is interesting, and I, it's great to see that you had 289 participants. That's a very, very well number because you can already um, actually get insights of that that are relevant because that is yeah. a number that you can then uh, multiplicate in some way uh, that you can actually have a representative number pretty much already, yeah. at least for that age group in this mm -hmm. case. Now, when it comes down, I mean, uh, again, you saw one of the examples I did earlier, building trust in online sales. Yeah. It is highly important. Um, mm -hmm. I think from that perspective, look, I mean, reviews is one thing. You can think mm -hmm. about how to give assurance in case something goes wrong. Um, yeah. That is one thing where you can, because you now have to think about, you have that insight. Okay, mm -hmm. 64 or the, the, the slightly more that are just buying offline, okay, you mm -hmm. might have a hard time getting them in the first place. So you should mm -hmm. first focus on the ones that are already willing to buy online. So while it's great to know while the people prefer still offline, you need to understand why are the other ones buying online and how yeah. the are already searching for it. And how far, for example, does Google, school is still a competitor of yours, even though you say there is no, because people will still search hmm. online, where is the next one? And then yeah. they, go they don't have their shop of trust, <laughs> right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, we did uh, we did even ask uh, there were more questions in the survey which asked uh, online people why they prefer online and most answer was because it is more convenient. I don't have to go to a shop to get it. Uh, and yeah. there were some answers which that there are no shops nearby. I don't know where to get the repairs. No. So those were the answers. And that, is, that is, for example, taking this up is a great way to put up as one of your unique points to say, okay, um, people like to do it online, but they still don't know where. So we're bringing yeah. it right into their place. So you can target this group because if I were you, I would now focus mm -hmm. primarily on the group that is already willing to use online because it is easier to convince them to use your solution. Yes. And once you have an adoption rate and people start telling the offline people, hey, you know what? You can get it done, it's secure, and I can even do it. Those is how you can then convince, because in the end, uh, uh, word of mouth is still one of the strongest things. If somebody comes yeah. to you and says, that's something that works, you might trust them more than reading it on the social media post saying, this works. So uh, yeah. 
I think it's great. I would, I would definitely continue and think about um, what is the result that you get out of those service and try to mm. get behind it. Why is it that they don't trust? It's yeah. not enough just to know they don't trust. It's understanding mm. why they don't trust. And when you mm. understand the why behind that question, that's when you can start building your solution yeah. around it and tackling that. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you very much also for your presentation. Thank you, Pranav. Our uh, next idea shall be brought forward by Shubham Yadav. I'll call Shubham Yadav. Hello. Yeah. yeah. Good evening, everyone. So I'm Shubham Yadav. Let me present my screen. Is my screen visible? Not yet. Yeah, now it's coming up. Yeah. So I'm here to talk about the problems and solutions of Indian healthcare system. So why are you doing this? Because in recent uh, COVID-19 times, our healthcare system broke down and uh, uh, both COVID and non-COVID patients suffered a lot during this period. So we surveyed to, we surveyed to identify some of the issues they faced during this time period. So uh, our survey results, according to our survey, 50% of patients in home isolation and 46% uh, of patients in hospitalization face the issue of oxygen shortage, 20% of non-covered patients and 64% of hospitalized COVID patients and 57% of COVID home isolated patients faced an issue of lack of trained staff for medical consultancy and 23% of COVID and 20% of non-COVID patients faced some issues regarding ambulance. So our solution to these results are like we are uh, Thinking of designing a platform where all the information that one may require at the time of medical emergency can get. And uh, we will be providing information like availability of beds for COVID and non-COVID patients, medicines uh, and ambulances around them, information about vaccine stores around them and the operating timing of hospitals nearby them. And also we will be providing the information of suppliers of oxygen medicine suppliers and uh, provide the option to verify those uh, verify those suppliers so that everyone can get the real information what they need so we will also provide information about ngos so that uh, people who are not that financially uh, stable can get the help and how are we going to collect the data so either we are using apis present on the websites or we are currently focusing on hyper model system so we can contact uh, everyone manually. And what will we do after COVID? So after COVID, we will provide inf provide information about the symptoms, about other diseases, and provide information about nearby hostels which will be, which will be good for their treatment. So that's yeah, so. all. Thank you. Thank you, Shabam. I like the last point about it. Of a recommendation on where to go to based on availability. Um, I mean, COVID, I mean, it's only present thing um, all over the world. I think we have seen what it has done with our health systems overall. I know some parts are worse than in others. Um, so um, also, once again, uh, something very interesting to tackle. Um, when I was looking at the numbers you showed up and your target customers, um, the consumer is the one part, right? The one that has the need of going to the ambulance. Um, and this is the one that obviously you want to help. Um, what is going to be potentially a struggle where you really need to figure out and validate if it's feasible or not is that usually ambulances and hospitals are not always the most digitalized and sometimes they don't even have the inventory fully there of knowing how much of the vet is currently kind of there. And if they're willing to send this information out to an app, that is kind of gathering all that information. Have so you done it on the hospital side if there is something we, that we will, are willing to share all that? Yeah, we will focusing on hypermodal system so that we can contact them manually to get their contact details. 
and we can display the contact details on our website so that everyone can contact them. Okay. And how are you solving the issue in the effect of knowing if cats are still available? So it would mean I would have to then yeah. call all of them up? No, no, no. The availability of beds can be um, sold. Uh, information about them can be taken by the APIs using uh, different platforms. So there are different different people who are specifically for some reasons. So we can collect an API for their um, platforms and we can display the information on our platform. Like so together. That means those are all open APIs that you can actually uh, retrieve um, and also get all that information feasible as well. What, sir? So that means you say that those open API calls are there for you to actually extract that information and it's open yeah. data. Yeah, yeah. We can collect, we can get the APS from you. Okay, because um, I think that I mean from a convenience standpoint, it's great to know where to go and what to do. So I think um, if you can figure out, I feel that you will have to do the most investment on the side of getting the data into your system because once you have gathered all the data then you can actually provide a very good value to the consumer so i feel personally when you go down into more details um i would definitely try to tackle the hospital side first understanding what are they allowed to share what can they share and how can you then turn this data into a valuable feature for your consumer um, as an expected um but again uh, also with that i have Two of my co-founders are Indian as well, and they also have family there. And uh, I've heard very, very tough uh, family moments there as well. So I'm uh, really hoping for you to be able to improve a bit of that situation around that. Thank you, Shubham, also for your pitch today. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Shubham. Um, our next uh, pitching will be done by Sahil Nizam. I would like to call Sahil Nizam. Hello, am I audible? Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Sahil, an undergraduate at uh, IIT Guwahati. Well, firstly, I'd like to talk about the time I spent at campus. You know, college was a great place of activity. All of us were very inquisitive. And uh, I spoke around a little bit and uh, you know, the uh, general idea was people were really interested about finances, say, you know, how we make money or how do I manage the money I earn or what else can I do to earn money? But uh, the issue was there wasn't really a benchmark or like a, side, a proper collection of ideas from which they could uh, attain a knowledge, the necessary knowledge or there was a lot of cluelessness where to start from say. And basically at the end of the day, people either want to get rich or at least they don't want to end up broke. So we, we felt that it would be a great idea if we could actually collect different uh, learning resources regarding finance and help in the general financial literacy of the youth. This could be about how you set up a bank account or uh, how you file your taxes or uh, how you end up paying your uh, GST or what do you do you have a general idea of the financial situation expected of you at and uh, uh, basically in India it's uh, like there isn't much of a allowance per month for the child you know where he can get started how he manages his account or there isn't a after school job where he earns a bit and you know how knows how to spend. They're very coddled and very well kept, you can say. But a lot of them were very interested. So just to find out whether actually people are interested, we floated around a form. And uh, in the survey, there were around 200 responses. Uh, what we found were uh, mostly 18, 19 undergraduate or freshmen in college were ready to learn about finances. Uh, some of them knew how to operate a bank account and uh, but they didn't have ideas about tax. They were willing to file their own taxes or learn about the stock market, invest in stocks, the cryptocurrency, the boom about it. But they didn't know where to start. And uh, there was a great interest among them. And, you know, we're really just getting started. So our idea was we could do a collection of links, websites, books and uh, short videos. And we would club them around in a place and present it to the youth so that they could get started into the world of finances and uh, learn how to, you know, file an IT return. Because uh, 
in second year of the college they'll be starting internships and in a couple of years they'll be uh, on the road of employment where they are supposed to be financially responsible so this could be a starter to the world of finance for them and this was our idea we haven't really come up with anything we just started ideating around a month ago and uh, i think our plan would be to firstly collect all the necessary resources and uh, present it in such a format so that the youth is actually interested in it you, you know they don't end up they don't feel bored after doing it uh, that's our idea and sir uh, it would really help if you could uh, add something to it absolutely i try my best thank you sir uh, actually what you kind of mentioned is something that i have missed throughout my personal uh, school education uh, because i'm now able to do the weirdest stuff in mathematics after i have finished school but i'm not even aware back then on how do i do my taxes something that every person needs in a daily life so i i i i'm always shocked by that because uh, i i was always lacking that real world examples when it comes down to numbers mathematics finances that i think it would be useful for everyone so from that need perspective uh, i definitely see even here in germany uh, people not having any clue about all of that um when it comes down to your idea i think one crucial element which i see is you need to validate how you make money with that because on the one hand it's a great thing obviously for you to do all that effort and you know i'm personally not intrinsically motivated uh, i'm not extrinsically motivated by money at all because i'm also doing it i want to help startups across the world succeed because i see the need for it and i've gone through that journey myself i know how bad it can be and i see that on your side as well however you need to at least be sustainable in order to keep on providing that service to those people because you can't do it just for free all your life because you will not be able to survive and if you cannot survive your business cannot survive so i think what would be interesting to understand is whereas those students are now saying i would like to learn about myself to understand do are they willing would they be willing to pay for education or would they rather than go for any other app that does the job for them like tax apps there's more and more of those apps coming out so i think when it comes down to the validation part i would definitely now look at your consumers you've understood the problem that they have you see some willingness to 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 do something like that now it's an understanding is it worth a business can i build a business model around it where i can make revenues in order to sustain and grow that i think those are the elements at your stage now that i would look into in order to understand is it just a nice thing to do or is it a business i can build out of it because that could be as i see right now a potential neck breaker because those 18 19 year old do not have much money to pay you and how much money are they willing to pay you for you to be able to do that or is it somebody else another revenue stream where you get that money and in order to do that it in more in a social entrepreneurship way so i think those would be the elements i would like you to focus on um in order to evaluate is it worth going on or not uh thanks a lot sir we'll definitely look into it great again sorry that it becomes a bit of a shorter feedback i just want to make sure because theoretically we would be running out of room if that at least we get a quick chance for feedback for those startups sure um yeah sure sir in fact we'll be moving on to our uh, last idea now and okay. it shall be brought to you by abhishek gupta i'd like to call okay. abhishek gupta on the floor wasn't it abhishek that directly said no need in the beginning yeah it was him <laughs> so let me see in how far you've implemented the no need aspect <laughs> into your idea actually uh, abhishek is not with us we would like to invite rishab jalan for um, okay. presenting his idea hello am i audible yes yeah so i think everyone is running out of time so i will just take two minutes of your time <laughs> so, okay so as you saw that um, um, young children are doing great work like 12 years old 13 years old 8 years old and all and the academic pressure has been increased a lot so what is happening these days that they're not able to play outside they're just busy in their um, academics or in the games and smartphones all day which is harming their physical um, structure and like a uh, physical health and what we are observing that a average day in a kid's life is also getting similar to an average day in an adult's life 
they wake up they just sit on their desk and complete their task and just just eat and then sleep so um there is a need to make a fitness application for kids as well because currently all the fitness applications are made basically for 20 years old 25 years old and older than that but no one is focusing on the 10 years old who is also having a lifestyle change due to the coming up of digital world so we are making a fitness application for kids and we provide proper gamification so we use the front camera to identify if the kid is doing the exercise or not so basically the idea is that a animated cartoon or a trainer would be doing the exercise the kid just has to follow it a fun workout like a zumba workout is going on or a stretching exercise is going on the kid just has to follow it and just copy it and if they do it properly they would be earning some points those points can then be redeemed for some discount coupons or some free gifts for them so that is the whole idea around it so currently we are in the mvp mode testing it out with over 100 users right now so okay. getting their feedback and looking for advice thank you thanks also for that uh rashab i can tell you i'm sitting in my small room right now uh the past months i've seen this happening to me as well my original background is i used to be a sports student at, at doing sports marketing communications i used to work out a lot but the past one and a half years not just the founder life but also covid had that effect on me as well so i definitely something uh, valid for old people as well as young ones um when it comes down to the young ones uh, there's two three elements which i would be interested um for you to look at or uh, that you should consider first of all who is your target customer your target customer is the child in the end however the one is paying for it is the mother yeah right? so, uh, the, that is one thing you need to consider it's a special triangle when you're targeting solutions at children that you need to kind of understand their needs but the ones who are paying for it will be the mother because she wants the best for her child and um, so that is something definitely to include if the mother see the need as well or um like how do the parents feel about the current situation uh the second thing i would like you to look at is the fact that children have a sense that they like to do stuff with other people whereas i love the ideas that you had also with the cartoons and i can see this working in some way for sure is that children still have that tendency of meeting other children and doing something with them obviously in times of covid this was a bit hard we are getting out of that again um, and obviously uh, there's some pieces that will remain i think some of it has changed with the long term effect but the question is and how far um you can initialize potentially even then group things so that the children do it together or if it can be at all a replacement for those children to say i don't want to go out and play soccer on the streets or cricket but i'm actually using an app to do it alone in my living room i think that is something which i am not yet 100% sure about uh, in terms of the customer need in terms of the children's need is that something that they enjoy doing through the animation and the uh, gamification that you build in or would they still prefer going out um and also for the mothers right the mother will ask the question to the child child as well um is it now better for my child to do that workout at home because otherwise it wouldn't get any workout or do i rather want to send it outside on the street and play with other kids um and have a social component to it as well i think those are the crucial elements that are a potential neck break you could see for that business and i would focus your studies or whatever survey you do also as part of the initial study which is great 100 people is a good number to do it um but focus on those elements to see whether this could potentially be an issue for your business or not okay so for that what we were thinking was to have a multiplayer mode where two or more friends mm -hmm. can join in and then they can compete who is doing better and all that stuff and giving mm -hmm. the rewards and points and badges and secondly for the parent section yeah that is a bit of a challenge to make the parents assume that okay there are two options either your kid doesn't exercise at all or he at least um, goes on this application Mm -hmm. so what we think is that for that we are having a report section where the parent can track the progress and all that stuff we have not figured it out properly that how we would be um, communicating to the parents and all that stuff so yeah that is a valid point and secondly what we think is um for the market need that um, as we know that um, some of the kids would not be able to go back to the previous normal because imagine being a 7 year old or 8 year old and seeing this kind of a castro um, like this kind of a experience of having a pandemic at such young age so that kind of a fear also comes in into some um, children and 
some would not be used to going out and playing again so that's right. why we think that the market can be there and just giving it a try absolutely i mean uh, the the way you approach it right now having an mvp with 100 households that's how you validate it right in the end it is exactly about that um you don't know whether whether it's working or not if you haven't tested it so i think having that study right in the beginning and then taking a decision to move on or not based on the results is the actual is the absolute correct approach um again um uh, i think it's good also that you've thought about potential solutions on how to overcome it um still before kind of going deeper and deeper into ways to overcome it you first need to see if those proposed solutions in the end would be taken up because they are actually fulfilling that need or not in first place so that is i think still something um i still feel um which you need to go a bit deeper into in order to understand yes you have great ideas and i like your ideas really um i think they are interesting ideas to overcome those but the question is will they still be adopted and seen as a good alternative to the existing play with your friends outside right yeah, yeah, sure. so i think um no but still uh uh liking that idea in general because i see this to be an issue and i have just the other day seen numbers on on the tv saying that in the second wave or the third wave of the pandemic here in germany the moving time of children has dropped by almost an hour a day and that is crucial um for the development of a child on the long term as well so whatever we can do in order to get get more children to move and outside to sports i think all those initiatives are also very much yeah, needed so my next so, question uh, was about uh, how things are in germany so yeah you answered it well that kids also <laughs> facing it there so thank you thank you for it yes. yeah thank you for your presentation thank you rishab um sorry to the other we are extremely sorry to the other participants that due to time constraints we won't be able to um share your uh, ideas and i yeah thank you now. sir we're talking about that yeah, yeah. yeah. uh yes sir you I, were saying something i i actually have yeah i actually have something here for you and i'm happy for you to share it with all the participants because i see that by now um there is definitely less participants than there in the beginning um because i might have a solution to for them so uh, i just have a few things i want to share as the goodies now for your startups and the last slide also something for the ones that might not have been able to do the pitching today themselves um so i just want to share this with you because you as iit uh, sell you're our partner and i just want to make sure that i'm kind of giving those potentials goodies to you as well um can you already see my screen here uh do you see this two dash uh thing here um okay then in this case this is the first thing uh, right now uh, whereas we have already built the community out there under community.dodash.com uh we're currently um in the process of building our mvp and this beta goes out uh, actually next month where we help startups to guide them through a structured due diligence process so you're while we're asking all the questions that a potential investor could ask you at the later stage you directly see an automatic feedback on how investable you already are at this point in time on where you need to focus in order to improve your business right so this is something um that might be of great relevance for all of the ones now taking those next steps because um i can uh, share this uh, link in here as well and i'm happy to share it in a follow up email that you can share with everybody else as well So if you yourself go on uh, this https2h.com there's a sign up form just with an email and if you sign yourself up for the beta um you can be one of the early testers as well of that platform and get access to over 42000 uh investors out there uh, worldwide that could potentially be the next investor in your startup idea. And the second thing I would like you oh for whatever reason it's not in here um let me just see for whatever reason it's not there because we also do have uh the opportunity of a 90% discount for you guys when it comes down to uh one of the partner products which we have which is based on a uh, data vault a secure document sharing tool so you might have had that issue of sending a pitch deck to somebody and uh, fearing that somebody else for example uh, will forward it and you don't know what happens with the data or if that other person has even looked at it at all or not so for those people um we are now offering a 9% discount on data vault um for you as a partner in here um i'm happy to share that link in the short summary of that right after that session as well 
And last but not least, for the ones that haven't been able to pitch today, um, feel free again to reach out to me directly via email, uh, Pranav, to share it with the others or my LinkedIn profile or on the Doodash community platform. And if you have a pitch deck and you want some evaluation and potential next steps to come out of it, you can also submit that. We're collecting pitch decks and trying to give you feedback on that and taking you the next steps wherever. Um, we also have partners with us like AWS for the ones that have technology products, and we can offer up to 25,000 worth in credits um, that help you for different discounts to take the next step with your business. So I just want to bring this out to you as the opportunity um, for you to, to, to also make use of us as a partner here um, from that perspective. And again, I can be sharing those two links with you after and you can share it. With you. Yes, sir. Um, thank you, sir. It was really an enthralling and enlightening session with you this evening. I'm confident that each one of us here got to take home knowledge from your experience and are one step closer to validating our startup idea. On behalf of ESL IIT Guwahati, I would like to extend our heartfelt gratitude for cherishing this day with your presence. Danke, mein Haya. <laughs> Thank you, my hair. Thanks a lot, TK. <laughs> uh, that's all I can do. I, I'm, I'm unfortunately not there yet. So it was my pleasure. Thank you guys for listening in, uh, for inviting me another time. Uh, and again, I'm happy uh, to repeat such a session in the future as well. So in case there is demand from your side, uh, I'm happy to come back in here and, and have such a session with you with some personal interactive elements as well. <laughs>